thank you for coming. Hello, 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 hello. Hey there, Bill. Is it, am I, is this on? Am I on? Welcome. Welcome. Switching out here. Check, check. Hey, hey. All right. This will work. I can move this week. That's a good thing. So, I uh, wanted to welcome everybody <laughs> and wanted to. Uh, do this. I've been, I have been praying for this day for a long time now. We have a praise, and some of you have, have seen our, our visitor, but some of you haven't, and I, I wanted to, to let uh, mom and dad Westman, uh, Jared and Elena Westman, introduce little baby Jonah. We've been, we have been praying for this little one. If, if, if I think everybody knows, but he came into the world pretty early. And is has he reached his due date yet? November 9th is his due date, everybody. And so mom and dad are back home. And we, we need to be praising God and thanking God for this family. Okay, so let's give it up. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Ah, so precious. So every script writer has a creative process that they use. Whether it's a short story or, 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 or a novel, a film, or a play, in script writing, each, each play has three acts. Uh, act one sets the scene, uh, it introduces us to the characters, introduces the conflict. Um, act two is the majority of, of the story, and it develops everything that was introduced in act one and prepares us for the, the resolution, the climax in, in act three. But I, I learned something this week. There's an interesting thing that is done, a, a development, midway through the, the movie, the play, whatever it is. It's, it's literally called the midpoint. Okay, At the midpoint, it's usually in the middle of the, of the, the script. It introduces something. That there's an idea. That there's a, maybe a new character. Something raises the stakes, okay? And lets the audience, lets the reader know that from this point on, things are going to be different. And, and this is, it's remarkable. It, pretty much any movie you like, there's a midpoint. There's something, and, and I'll, just to give you some examples, um, if you remember the movie The Matrix, uh, when Neo goes to the Oracle and the Oracle says, yeah, you're not, you're not the one, right? That's the midpoint. My wife and I just watched uh, Top Gun Maverick. I know, I know, I know. Uh, we're like the last ones. And if you, if you haven't seen it yet, Spoiler alert, okay, but, 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 but the midpoint for, for Top Gun Maverick was when Iceman dies and uh, Maverick gets kicked out being the teacher and we're just like, whoa, what, what happens now? What, what's going to happen now? So, or for kids, Toy Story, all right, Toy Story. It's midpoint is when Woody and Buzz, not only are they lost, but Sid gets them and, and, and takes them back home. And now they've got to survive Sid and get back home. And Andy's about to move. And it's just, how is this? Raises the stakes. See? You see? You see? Now, chapter 8 of Mark 
we are, guess what, everybody? We're at the midpoint. There's 16 chapters in Mark. We are at the midpoint in, in, in Mark. And the more I read this gospel, like this is not an accident. Mark knows what he's doing. He, and, and things from this point on, the stakes get raised. Jesus is going to be saying things, doing things that we as readers are like, wait, wait, what? So let, we're going to read Mark 8, 22 through 30. If you got your Bibles, open it up to that, turn them on, or, or look at the screen. Mark 8, 22 through 30. They came to Bethsaida, and some people brought a blind man and, and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. When he had spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, do you see anything? He looked up and said, I, I see people. They look like trees walking around. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened, his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Jesus sent him home saying, don't even go to the village. Jesus and his disciples went on to, to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked? Who do you say that I am? Peter answered, you are the Messiah. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. These are the very words of God. We've got a picture that I love um, that I, whenever I think about Jesus healing blind men, I always think about this picture. So I, I want to have it up for a little bit while we're talking about that. We left off last week at the Gospel of Mark and, and things were, have been building th this entire time. Uh, Jesus had his third lesson on the lake with his disciples and they didn't hear him. They're, they're not understanding him. Um, they, 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 Jesus asked all these questions, and they're not really understanding. And Jesus also had the, the third run-in with the Pharisees. They asked him to do a sign. He says, no, I'm, I'm not going to do a sign. A sign's not going to do anything for you. He, he walks away. And, and immediately after that, Mark tells us of this strange, this twofold healing of the blind man. We, we don't know the blind man's name. We just know that, that he, he was brought to Jesus and people begged Jesus to, to touch him, to, to heal him. As we've already discussed, Jesus does not need to act like a miracle worker. He doesn't need to say incantations or, or hocus pocus, or he doesn't even have to touch the man. He, he, he Elsewhere in Mark, he just says words and things happen, right? Demons get cast out, storms get stilled, healings happen just with words. Other times, Jesus does choose to touch and, and, and take people away from the crowd and, and all these things. And so we've kind of already established he doesn't have to do anything. What he, he, there's always a reason, <laughs> There's always a reason Jesus does everything. And so, yeah, this story is so interesting because it's, it's a two-touch miracle. It, 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 nowhere has this happened before. So you could be asking, is Jesus' power running out? Does he, does he not, is he not powerful enough to heal at one time? Like, what's up with the, the two-touch miracle. After the, the first touch, the man could sort of see, right? Like he, he could see people walking around like trees. So, so he must have been able, you know, he used to be able to see, he used to know what a humans look like and what trees look like. And so, so 
that's interesting. And then the second touch, he can see everything clearly. So again, just what in the world is going on here? Like, this is so strange. I believe that Mark has deliberately put this account right here at the midpoint for a reason. Because again, this story, as, as you know, you heard, it is followed closely by Jesus asking his disciples not one question, but two questions. This, my friends, is a living parable. It is, Mark has placed the, the blind man receiving sight in stages right next to the disciples receiving insight in stages. Do you see how beautiful this is? So let's talk a little about the disciples, okay? So, so his disciples have been, they've been having a difficult run of it. They, they've been having a difficult time. As soon as they think they got Jesus figured out, he changes the game. He, he does different things. They're, they're having to constantly learn. They're, they're learning that that God comes first, others come second, they are third. They're, they're learning that Jesus is not a miracle machine. He, he, can't he, he won't just do miracles like a trained monkey. That's not how Jesus operates. And they're learning that whatever Jesus is doing is not just a Gentile or, or a Jewish thing. It's a, it's a whole world thing. Whatever this is, this is meant for Gentiles too. So they're, they're constantly learning. Things are, are still blurry though for the disciples. They're still wrestling with that, that first initial question. In the boat in chapter two, when, when Jesus stops a storm with a word, they, ask, they look at each other and they ask each other, who is this man? Who is th They're still, they haven't quite answered that. So let's continue on in Mark, verse 27. Again, Jesus asks a question. Verse 27, here we go. Thank you, Shauna. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? So, I've got a map here. Let's, let's look at where they're at, okay? And, and this isn't the, the best map in the world. Hopefully you can see, the, though, that Caesarea Philippi, way— I mean, they, they the healing of the two-touched blind man was Bethsaida, north shore of the Sea of Galilee there. But Caesarea Philippi, I mean, it is, it is up there. And, and you know, it's, it's just interesting that— he would have his band of disciples go all the way up, almost like geographically and culturally as, as far as you can go away from Jerusalem, right? Jerusalem's the, the epicenter of, of, of Judaism, right? So it's almost like Sydney, what Sydney is to Lincoln, you know? I mean, it's this, it's, well, I'm, I'm not going to go there, but, but Caesarea Philippi, was a city dedicated to, to Roman rule, uh, named after Herod Philip and, and the Roman emperor Caesar, um, Caesarea Philippi. It, it boasted a temple honoring the emperor as lord and liberator. Um, and Jesus had, had taken his, his band of disciples, again, just up there. It's it's a very big, very worldly, non-Jewish believing city, uh, or that, but it was still in range. Like it's not, it's not way like, you know, Egypt or anything. I mean, th th this is still as again as as far north pretty much as you can get, and and while he's up there, so he takes him up. And then the rest of Mark, again, Mark chapter 8, watershed moment. The rest of, of the gospel, they are on the way. That, that is Mark's signal. He, like he's, he's 
chapter 9, he's going to say that. In chapter 10, elsewhere, on the way, on the way. And it's on the way to the cross. It's on the way to Jerusalem. So, so he goes all, he, he takes him all the way north around this imperial city. And that is when Jesus chooses to ask this question of, of his disciples. Who do people say that I am? And since it's always easier to answer a question in the third person, because if it's wrong, hey, it's not what you thought. This is just what other people are, are thinking. The disciples, they give the three top, you know, the, the, the three top answers to, to Jesus' identity. Either Jesus is John the Baptist so somehow, like, I don't know, reincarnated as Jesus, or Elijah again, just, or, or another one of the prophets. I mean, at, at the very least, the crowds, the people around this time, they were thinking, Jesus is, is sent from God somehow. Like, like he is, he's, a, he's like a prophet. He really is. He's doing pro prophety things. He's, he's saying that what he's saying, how disruptive it is. I mean, since John the Baptist, there, there was, there was no, no prophet in Israel for 400 years. Then John the Baptist starts doing weird things, crazy things, different things, baptizing people in the Jordan and, and you know, saying stuff about repent, repent, repent. And Jesus is saying some crazy things, different things. And so at the very least, Jesus is a prophet. That's what the crowd is thinking. But it's interesting because the person's name, right? John, Elijah, any of the other prophets were the ones sent to proclaim and prepare for this one. So then Jesus asks another illuminating question. This is like the, the, the second touch given to the blind man. The, again, the, the blind man at the first touch, he, he sort of sees things like, but people are like trees. And, and the crowd see Jesus just as a prophet. But is that all Jesus is? Jesus asks, but what about you? What, what do you think? Who do you say I am? Verse 29. Thank you, Shauna. Now, before Peter answers that question, let's recall in the Gospel of Mark, the very first chapter, the very first verse, Mark 1, 1, we, Mark tells the readers right away, the beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, or in some of your translations, about half the translations say Christ, half say Messiah. It's the same word, Christos. Messiah is Christ, same word, the Son of God. So, so there's two titles given that we as readers know. We know right from the get-go. Mark, Mark tells us that Jesus is the Messiah and he's the Son of God. Now, now, but let's talk that first title, right? That first title, Messiah or, or Christ. What does that word really mean? Like, like some of us, I remember as a kid, I thought that that was Jesus's last name, like Jesus Christ. I thought that was just, but, but sorry, you're wrong. That, it's, it's a title. It's, 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 it's Messiah. It's a title, but still, okay, okay, it's a title, but, but what does it mean? It simply means the anointed one. It, it, it's, it's the anointed one, the, the prophesied one. It is, it is a very, very special title. But, but let's, let's not give Peter too much credit. It, when Peter says you are the Messiah, he's not saying that, that, that he's divine. He's not saying that, that Jesus is the second member of the Trinity. He is simply saying that he is the anointed one, the true king of Israel. That, that is what Peter thinks. It's way more of a political statement than a theological one. 
the disciples were not expecting a divine redeemer. They were longing for an earthly king to overthrow Rome. That's what, and, and, and Peter thought that they had their guy. Now, now, again, I, it's still remarkable that, that Peter, on his own, could come to that conclusion. It really is. I don't want I mean, that's, that's big. Um, you can see he's beginning, he at least, is beginning to see and understand, see and hear. He's beginning to, that Jesus is slowly coming into view here, but... <laughs> what, what Peter means by Messiah and what Jesus means by Messiah are, are two totally different things. It's sort of like the word love. Okay, um, do we remember how powerful that little English word love is? Um, let's say there's a young couple and they're dating, and let's say maybe it's date number four or five, and the, the guy says to the girl, gosh, I just, you know, as, as, uh, everything's perfect, and, and, and the moon is out, and, and he's just like, man, I, I, I love you. Now, he loves Doritos and, um, and hunting and, and the Broncos and... And, you know, he's got, he's got, he, yeah. What do you think she hears when, when he says, I love you? She maybe hears wedding bells. I mean, on the, on the fifth date. I mean, and, and I'm not sure, maybe, maybe he, he hears wedding bells too. I, I, I want to give the guy some credit. But, but that, that is a word that is loaded that generally guys, think one way, girls think another. And so when, 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 but so when Peter says, when Peter says, you're the Messiah, again, and we're going to dive way more into this next week, he's got a vision for what that word means, what that title means. Jesus has another, and, and spoiler alert, they're different visions, okay? They're, 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 they're just different. So, so Peter is right. He's technically correct, but what he says and does in the following lines, and again, we're going to get into it next week, it shows that, that he's wrong. He, he is simultaneously right and wrong at the same time, which is, it's a tough place to be for Peter. But um, so again, he's like the blind man whose eyes have been touched once he sees he's beginning to see things some light has dawned but it's going to take another touch by Jesus before he sees everything clearly now now we're we're halfway through mark we're at the midpoint of mark one of his disciples has spoken and used one of the titles that w that we as readers are given in mark 1:1 1, 1. he didn't get that Right? So, so he, halfway through, we get a title used on his own that Peter said. I mean, it, it is amazing. Now, it's at the very end of the book, at the crucifixion of Jesus, the other title is used in Mark 15, 39. I just want us to, Mark 15, 39. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus heard the cry, saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the son of God. Wow. A, a Roman centurion, the bad guy in the story, the outsider, the guy who had no business saying anything at all, has ears to hear and eyes to see and a heart that's open. And he sees what no one, that there is no figure in Mark up until this point that gets it. 
that sees that, that not only is Jesus the Christ, the anointed one, the, the true king of Israel, but he is the divine redeemer, the son of God. This is, this is amazing. And, and again, the, for, for the Roman, a Roman to, to, to say that, uh, every Roman coin at that time had inscribed on the coin, Tiberius Caesar, son of the divine Augustus. So, so the only person a Roman centurion w- would say is divine is, is Caesar. Um, but, but this man proclaimed, no, 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 no. Uh, because he heard and saw how he died, that this man is, is the Messiah. Uh, no, the son of God. <laughs> now, that's what the Roman centurion thought. But we're, we're still back in Mark 8. We're, we're reading those questions that Jesus is giving his disciples, and we're remembering that we are the disciples. And, and so Jesus asks us, more specifically, Jesus asks you, who do you say that I am? The, that question has to be asked this side of heaven. Asked and answered. Not just asked, but answered. This side of you, we have to, each of us, because I can tell, it, tell you until I'm blue in the face my, what I think my answer is, but, but you have to wrestle with that. How would you respond? I want seriously. If you, were, if you had a camera in your face with a microphone at your mouth, how would you respond? Who, who do you think Jesus is? All of us have to wrestle with that question. You do. Was he just a prophet? Was he just a wise teacher? Are the stories true? Is Jesus Lord? If he is Lord, what does that mean? In, in America, 2022, Sydney, Nebraska, what does it mean that Jesus is Lord? We've come to the pivotal chapter in Mark. Like I said, it's a watershed moment in Mark. And I, I don't know how much time that did how much time did Jesus give his disciples when he asked that second question? Was there, was there silence for a couple minutes as they were walking along? And Peter kind of stumbled into it and just said, you are the Messiah. Or was it a knee-jerk reaction? I, I don't know. I don't know. But I want us... I want us all, we need, I I want to create space here. This is a extremely important question. And maybe you've been going to church all your life. (laughs) Maybe this is your second week. I don't know. But how you answer this question (laughs) means everything. And so I want us to create space. I'm going to invite Todd Bosinger up, and, and he's just going to play a little music. And I want you, I want you to, to imagine you're on the road walking with Jesus. Jesus is looking right at you. He's not looking around you. He's looking in your eyes. And he's not mad or upset. He's more curious than anything. And he just leans in and he asks you, who do you say I am?
God, thank you um, for this day you've given us. And, and Lord, I, I know we've got people in here that Jesus is still a little, little fuzzy and they're not quite sure. God, I pray you would walk with them. Draw them to you. May they have open hearts, open eyes, open ears to hear you. God, God, if a Roman centurion in first century can understand that Jesus is divine, anybody can. And so, Lord, would you keep working? Keep pulling, pushing, drawing them closer and closer to you. And it may they be open and take that step, that scary step of faith. Where my words draw short, where everybody's words draw short, and they have to cling to Jesus. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for this gospel that we have. And thank you for this church. And now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever.